Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust." So the title for this message came from the final verse uh, in verse 11, the glorious gospel. And a key phrase in this passage is the phrase, teach no other doctrine. And so that's going to be a focus for today, a doctrine. And what I'd like to do is just explore uh, some of the godly wisdom and insight that Paul is uh, expressing to Timothy in these verses, and then explore the truth of this glorious gospel that Paul is talking about, and then my prayer is that the outcome will be that we will be edified in a godly way, and that it affirms our understanding of the gospel. And uh, if anybody here uh, would like uh, more information about the gospel, I'm happy to uh, help you with that after the service. But before we dig into this passage, uh, I want to tell you the story of this guy. His name is Johann. Among other things, he passed away 500 years ago. Uh, The year was 1519. A couple years before that, he became quite notorious uh, for a controversial doctrine which he espoused and he preached for nearly 15 years. Now, he was a friar. He was a traveling friar, and his job was a difficult one. His job was to raise money for the Roman church. And he went throughout Poland raising money, and he sold this interesting item called an indulgence, which his name is Johann Tetzel. And uh, indulgences existed long before him, but he really kind of ruined it for everybody. And he did so. Uh, Indulgences, if you don't know, were ways where people could put money into the church coffer and it would forgive them of their sins. It would absolve them not only of their current sins, but future sins. And it was a a very questionable practice that nevertheless went on. Well, he took it to the next level. When uh, the Pope wanted to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, uh, he needed money raised quickly for that, and it wasn't enough just to go to living people for their money. He needed to go to dead people for their money. You ask, how did he do this? Well, he came up with this idea that... uh, People could give money for a dead relative, and by doing so, that would spring them out of purgatory early. The idea of purgatory is not in the Bible anywhere. It's the idea that once you die, you go to this place of testing, and then once you've passed all that testing, then you finally get to go to heaven. Well, we know that as soon as we die, we go before God in judgment, not, in, not into purgatory. But people didn't know Scripture very well. The common person didn't know it. Very, uh, that's just the way it was. So he managed to convince people to say that, in fact, he came up with this uh, phrase. They had these like kind of golden bowls that people could put their money into, and he says, the moment that the gold within this bowl rings, a soul from purgatory springs. He, I don't know how he came up with that, but... It, uh, it, it caught on, and people thought that was the truth. Um, well, he was preaching this and making lots of money, raising lots of money to go uh, towards St. Peter's, until he came to Germany, and he was all over Germany, but he, he came to this uh, 
a town called Wittenberg, um, and somebody lived there that was not having this nonsense, and you may recognize a picture of Martin Luther there. This actually happened just before, and it triggered his 95 theses, which he put up on the wall. It finally he'd had enough. There's a lot of other things um, that were going on within the church, and so this was kind of like the final straw. And uh, he, he lambasted um, Johann Tetzel, and Tetzel actually became very unpopular after Martin Luther exposed kind of the fraudulent idea that you can pay money to get a dead relative sprung up into heaven. Uh, but the reason why I bring this up is because Paul talks about teach no other doctrine. Now, the people at the time didn't know, the common person didn't know what the true doctrine was because they had to trust that those who were in uh, spiritual authority positions were telling them the truth. And that, was, that sparked the Reformation. Um, so that's why this is kind of important, and this is just an illustration of why it's so important to have solid doctrine. So I want to get into the background a little bit of this passage, and um, it starts off in 1 Timothy with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. Paul makes a couple interesting points here. Number one, that he is an apostle, and an apostle is someone who is a disciple, but a disciple who's given more authority than, say, a common disciple. This is a, a leadership role that he was, is given. He's a follower, a, a leader for Jesus Christ by commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying it, he didn't make himself, he didn't appoint himself to be an apostle. There was no man that appointed him to be an apostle. Jesus Christ himself appointed Paul to be an apostle, and we'll look at that uh, in just a moment. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you open up your, your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, it's well worth it to see how exactly Paul did uh, receive this commission directly from Jesus Christ. So this is in Acts chapter 9, and if you'll follow along with me, Acts chapter 9, in verse 1, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder, against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he had done, has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Paul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached 
the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. May the Lord bless the reading of that scripture. Through Acts chapter 9, we see the conversion that Paul uh, went through, how previously he was a persecutor of Christians, and Jesus Christ himself personally appeared to him and commissioned him like an officer to preach to the Gentiles and to kings and to um, the, the world. So prior to, um, prior to Paul's conversion, he was committed to legalism. And legalism is a belief that justification comes through adherence to the law. He was extremely devoted to following the law. And in fact, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 and 6, he explains that he was basically an all-star of all-stars when it came down to following the law. He said, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, meaning the law, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But Paul had come to realize that all of these qualities, him being faultless according to the law, were insufficient for salvation. And would you turn over to Galatians chapter 3, and Paul explains a problem that the church had come into. Those who were early believers came to faith in Christ, were saved by faith, but then they thought that their lives were perfected by the law. Some were told that they had to follow the law, they had to be circ Gentiles had to be circumcised and other things, and, and Paul is, is trying to put the kibosh on this idea that, that the law uh, is ju justifies the saved. And so in Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham quote, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, quote, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Paul is making it clear to the Galatians that they're treading on dangerous ground. Their doctrine needs to be adjusted. It needs to be corrected. That it's not through the works of the law that one is justified. And one area that the legalistic approach fails so easily is because people become concerned more with appearances over reality. It becomes a control issue with human authority, and that's what we saw in the case of Johann Tetzel. The human authority had elevated itself above God, above Scripture, 
and when human authority is elevated on spiritual issues, the earthly cares will override the spiritual ones, and then serious errors of doctrine and sinfulness take over. So let's take a look um, at, at this passage. Paul, who's established himself as an apostle, as a leader, by the direct commandment of Jesus Christ himself, he's writing to Timothy, who he describes as a true son in the faith. Um, many of you probably know that the apostle Paul was never married. He never had biological children. But this phrase, a true son in the faith, is important, and it's especially important to him because he considered Timothy to have a genuine faith, and he calls him a true son. Now, uh, Timothy grew up, uh, he was Greek, his father was Greek, a Gentile, and his mother was Jewish. And his mother, uh, his mother's name was Eunice, and his grandmother's name was Lois. And both of them uh, taught him from a very early age uh, to, uh, they prepared Timothy to accept Christ by teaching him the Old Testament scriptures from infancy to recognize the Messiah when he appeared. So when Paul came and he preached Christ, all three of them accepted his teaching. They committed their lives to the Savior. Now, um, there's a, a good article on this topic in gotquestions.org, and I'm just going to read part of it, which is the conclusion to this situation of, of Timothy being raised with scripture. And they write, we too must prepare our children to be ready when Christ moves in their hearts. They must know how to recognize that pull on their spirits as coming from the Savior, and the only way to do that is to follow the example of Eunice and Lois and teach our children the Word of God. Amen? It's so important that children be just completely saturated with the Word of God, and um, we can see the effects of that on Timothy. Timothy was a very young man, a very young pastor uh, when he was called. And one of the areas that, uh, one of the greetings that was very common that, that Paul did, um, he, he talked about grace and peace from God. And in this particular instance, he actually, he adds a word in the middle. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. This is his blessing on Timothy in I would submit that this may be one of the greatest blessings that we can get from God. And let's take a look at grace, mercy, and peace for a moment. Because grace um, is defined as an act uh, or an instance of kindness, a favor or a privilege, and especially unmerited assistance. Grace is something given to somebody that doesn't deserve it, hasn't earned it. And that grace is something that we receive from God. Mercy is leniency or compassion. The forbearance, a forbearance means refraining from enforcing something. So mercy is having a punishment that's due and the one in authority refrains from that punishment, withholds that punishment. And then peace, peace with God is the greatest, the greatest gift that he can give us. And they, talk, and they talk about the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And we can't describe how deep that peace is. But peace is harmony. It's with God, it's, you're, you're on the same page. You're singing notes that are complementary to each other. Um, you're friendly. You're on a friendly basis. And the, one of the interesting things about peace is that sometimes people confuse peace with a truce. And there's a big difference between the two. Truce is happen or basically people stop firing at, at each other, but they still hate each other. A truce is usually something that's just, well, we're just not going to fight until uh, we get strong enough to come back and start fighting again. But peace is, is the opposite of that. There, there's no animosity anymore. That animosity is gone. And peace is, is an abiding, deep uh, friendship that we have. And so grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father is a wonderful blessing that God extends to Timothy, and it's also something that we can extend and should extend towards everybody else in our normal day-to-day uh, -day relations. We can be gracious, we can be merciful, and we can be peaceful with others. So I, I really like that introduction that he gives. So Paul continues, uh, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. 
And in this passage, Paul makes it really clear that he that Timothy is in a really difficult position. He's young. He's a pastor in Ephesus, which is a very uh, idolatrous culture. Uh, the, the book to the Ephesians that he wrote um, is very appropriate for where Timothy is. He tells him to remain in Ephesus because the pressure is so strong on Timothy that Timothy wants to bail out on it and leave. So he has to tell him, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge, and charge is like a command from an from a authoritative person, from a superior officer, that they teach no other doctrine. So already, false doctrines were being spread in the early church, and it was Timothy's charge to, t- to tell them to teach no other doctrine. Also, he told them not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Does anybody here do genealogies, dot ancestry.com or anything? My, my sister loves doing genealogies. Um, I don't have the patience for them. But back then, genealogies were really uh, a a hot topic of conversation. Now, he's not talking about just any genealogy. He's talking about endless genealogies. Some people tried to justify themselves by tracing their lineage all the way back to Abraham and saying how important their family line is and how much better they were than somebody else because of who they came through. And it it was kind of endless, and, and these disputes were kind of endless because they caused disputes fables. Uh, there are a lot of fables, especially in Ephesus, idolatry about who God is. And, and there's more modern fables. We saw indulgences. Indulgences it pride on a fable of purgatory. It's a myth. It doesn't exist, but it, pried on, it preyed on people. Uh, another myth that was very common uh, and has been common is the idea of transubstantiation, which is the idea that when the, we take communion that the bread and the, the cup actually c- conform and become the actual body of Christ as we consume it. Uh, and that's, that's a fable. It doesn't happen that way. The communion is a symbolic of our relationship with Christ. How about the Holy Grail? There's a myth right there, and there's a movie made about the Holy Grail that it supposedly had caught the blood of Christ, and anybody who drank from that cup would have eternal life. Well, we know from Scripture that the only way to have eternal life is through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not in any item, but these fables become prominent and accepted, and they become accepted because people don't know what the true doctrine is. Some other ones, um, maybe you've seen the Shroud of Turin, the one that they claim has the image of, of Christ on it. It's a fable again. They like to have these things that they can hold on to because of their mystical value, not because of the truth behind them. The shrouds can't save. Any mystical items uh, don't save and, in fact, are dangerous. But there is a real danger that Paul is warning Timothy to fight against. And we find that in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, where Paul writes, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And I highlighted that because that is a really common situation that has gone on throughout the the centuries and is common now, that there is a form of godliness that denies its power, and that is something that we have to be on guard for through understanding the doctrine of the Bible. Paul says, and from such people turn away, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then that last part, I see the definition of a con man. A con man looks for gullible people, weak people to prey on, and the form of godliness that denies its power, I think, is related to this con game that's going on, conning people into throwing money into a pot that cannot save somebody, many other things always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Paul continues, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, 
persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I didn't highlight that, but it should be highlighted, could be highlighted. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that last line uh, deserves to be repeated. You have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The importance of the scriptures is that they, they give us wisdom. They give us the, the direction to salvation through Christ. And indeed, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us how important they are. At this time, the entire New Testament hadn't been completed, but it applies to the New Testament as well as the Old Testament when Paul writes, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we see that the scripture is inspired. Some translations say God breathed, and the, the word in the Greek is talking about it being directly sent from God through breath, which is also synonymous with spirit. It's a spiritual inspiration that scripture was given to the men, and it was preserved. It's profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is the truth. Is what should we believe? How can we not be deceived for doctrine? Reproof is, can you correct somebody when they're wrong? And people need to be corrected when they're wrong. That's, or stopped when they're wrong. And then correction guides them back to what the truth is. And instruction in righteousness is simply the idea of discipline. It's training. Uh, it's profitable to be trained and disciplined in righteousness. And the whole purpose is, is that we can be completed, equipped for every good work. And getting back to the uh, scripture passage in 1 Timothy, Paul continues in verse 5. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. So one of the issues with legalism and ad adherence to the law is the fact that the love from a pure heart uh, becomes uh, a casualty. Uh, from a good conscience becomes a casualty and sincere faith can become a casualty to legalism. It's interesting that he says some have strayed. They've strayed from the pure heart. They've strayed from a good conscience and sincere faith and they've turned aside to idle talk. And just like endless genealogies, idle talk, if something is idling, it's not going anywhere. And they've, it's a good description of uh, something just kind of in neutral, talk that's worthless. It's not going anywhere. They desire to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand what they're saying, uh, nor the things which they say they believe. Continuing on in verse 8, Paul says, but writes, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. According to the glorious gospel, of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Now this list here is not exhaustive. It's kind of like the most obvious. We can see that those who are lawless, they don't care about the law. They're insubordinate. They won't take instruction. They, they, uh, they reject authority. Unga for ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane, murderers, for those who are sexually immoral, for kidnappers, for liars. These are like the obvious ones, but it says there's any other thing that is contrary to sound 
doctrine is also included in this list, that the, the law is for them. And the law, it should be abundantly clear now that how important the truth of Scripture is, and we all know this, that there is one true doctrine that's revealed in Scripture. There are many false teachers who support other doctrines, and this has gone on for centuries. We must be vigilant to discern what is true, and we must search and study the Scriptures so that we know the truth. We can correct ourselves when we are in error. We can reprove and stop others when they're in error. And we can also instruct ourselves in God's righteousness through Scripture. So I'd, I'd just like to conclude by talking about this glorious gospel that Paul is talking about, which was committed to Paul's trust. And we're going to use, just walk through Scripture for this. In Genesis, Moses records how God created the world, how God created mankind and all that exists. And in the beginning, God created the world in perfection because God is perfect. When he was created, Adam had a pure relationship with God. Then the devil in the form of the serpent fooled even Adam into sinning against God by disobeying him, by being insubordinate and trusting in a lie instead of God who is the truth. At that moment in the garden, the human race became separated from God spiritually, and the result is that death entered into the world and we each became destined for eternal separation from God in hell. That's the bad news. And to have good news, we need to know the bad news. The good news is, is that God created a plan of redemption. He intervened. God used the law given to Moses to describe his holiness and perfection. The way to please God is to love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and to sincerely love our neighbor. The obvious way to death is to follow our natural desires, to follow the devil's plan, which is pridefully puffing ourselves up, following selfish desires, loving pleasure rather than loving God, lying, cheating, stealing, murdering, chasing the desires of our flesh. But even if we could find a way to eliminate all sinfulness from our hearts and follow God's law perfectly, it is still not enough to justify us before God. Good works please God, but they are simply not enough to save us from our destiny in hell apart from God. Following the law cannot cleanse us from the filthiness of our sin. The law of God was given to teach us how we fail God's standard of righteousness and how deeply we need God to intervene on our behalf. With Israel, God instituted the sacrificing of a lamb, innocent and pure, to cover or atone for the sins of the people. But each sacrifice was insufficient to pay the full cost of sins because the sacrifices continued over and over. The regular sacrifices were reminders that there is a steep price to pay for our sinful nature. And ultimately, that price is our death and separation from God for eternity. There was nothing pure enough in this world that could pay that full price until God himself became human in the person of Jesus Christ. Because God is perfect, Jesus' life was sinless and perfect beyond value. And his voluntary death on the cross was sufficient to pay the cost of eternal life for everyone, a price that was beyond mere human ability to pay. But while the price was paid, this gift from Jesus must be received on our part. Many reject it because they consider the cost too high. The cost is that whoever receives Christ's sacrificial payment must surrender their life to Jesus Christ in return, not through the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, that he is God and the king of all things, especially us. Amen. And instead of trying and failing to justify ourselves before God, we have been provided this one and only one way to be forgiven of our sin. That only way is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to just summarize this message with three verses. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. John three sixteen. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. In Matthew 16, 25, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will surely find it. Amen. Amen. 